before that we continue to praise God. I told someone in the uh, congregation that I was going to wear a t-shirt in honor of her granddaughter that died two years ago. And in the back of it, as you can see, it's her name and everything. Now she told me, and I'm, I'm not doubting that right now, but she told me she was also going to wear a t-shirt. So let me see. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we are going to remain seated, and this song is so appropriate. We are going to sing Mansion Over the Hilltop. Amen. Oh, oh, oh. 
you have your Bibles, would you be turning to the book of 1 Samuel? 1 Samuel. Y'all did a great job. Appreciate you ministering to us in music. Uh, next time I want to see uh, three generations of men up here. <laughs> I want to see you young fellas. I want to see Michael. And I want to see uh, Granddad. Yeah. You do sing, don't you? Oh, really well. Oh, everybody say yes. Yes. Oh, he just grinned. He ain't committing. Uh, we're so proud of him. Good to see all of you here today. What a good looking bunch of people. Appreciate you coming. We're going to read in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, starting with verse 3 in just a moment. I'll let you get there for those of you that turn in your Bibles. It will be on the screen. 1 Samuel 17. Alright, would you stand for the reading of God's word? 1 Samuel 17, verses 3 and 4. This is what it says. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. You can already picture in your mind two mountain tops with a valley in between. And the Philistine army is on one side, and God's army from Israel is on the other side. And you can see, and you've heard the story how they were at odds and trying to go to battle. And all of a sudden, on the Philistine side, stood out a man named Goliath. Yes. It says here he was, what, uh, nine cubits? Six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span. I looked it up. Six cubits and a span is nine feet, nine inches. And a good basketball player. <laughs> I wonder what kind of warrior he was. Must have been a mighty warrior for everybody to be afraid and to be the leader of the Philistine army. We've heard about Goliath. We've heard about the giants. The message today is facing today's giants. That's the message. That's the title. Facing today's giants. David is probably one of the most famous young men because of all the things he went through. He grew up as a lad tending sheep. He had a great background to face Goliath. In tending sheep, we read stories how he killed lions and fought off enemies, protecting the sheep. Sheep's big business. His family needed it. He had older brothers. He had uh, different ones. They all had their jobs. And his job was the sheep. And that was no little job, no little task. Can you imagine being out there with a bunch of sheep all day long? Sheep are not aggressive animals. They don't have claws to tear at you with. They don't have vicious things to bite you. They're not very aggressive. Most of the time when we read about sheep, we just say they're dumb. Yeah. Some of you say, well, I know how David felt. I've hung around dumb people before. <laughs> David took care of those sheep because their lives and the livelihood of his family and his life depended on. 
Now he's gotten older. Not much older. He's still a lad. And he's going to come up against a giant by the name of Gal, uh, Goliath. Yeah. And he faces a lot of obstacles. We can read into this story our own lives. Because each of us have giants in our lives. Not sure what your giant is right now. Let me name a few. Get it on. That's a giant. I don't like it. I have to fight against it. Right? I'm losing many times. Financial giants. Where will I have enough money to last me until I die? I'm going to fix out my will for my kids. And most wheels start out of being a what, a sound mind? And I won't mind to say being a sound mind, I spend it all. <laughs> but I want to have enough to last me till the day I die. Finance is another giant that we face. We face giants of trying to raise our children, and to raise our grandchildren, and to make sure they're taken care of and they're kept safe. Make sure they have what they need. And they're pretty big giants at times. Many of us look at the world around us today and realize it's changed from when we were young. It's not as safe as it used to be. Now there's more things to be afraid of. And we're concerned about our kids and our grandkids. We don't worry about ourselves. I've lived a long, good long life. If I die, I'm going to be with Jesus. If the world gets worse and worse, so be it. That is scary. I tell everybody nowadays, I'm not even afraid to go to jail because I worked in prison as a chaplain. It don't scare me. I remember the first day I walked into the prison to go to work and I was looking around Hearing all the doors playing behind me and all the little sally ports I had to go through to get inside and seeing all these prisoners around. And the warden explaining to me that I was on my own because I asked him first day. I said, I said, I'm going to be working with these prisoners. And I said, how many do I work with at a time? He says, one on one up to 25 on one. And sometimes up to 100 or 200. I had special programs going on. I said, okay. And I said, how many of your correction officers are going to be with me when I'm working with a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-25 in a class? And he said, zero. I said, what? Are you going to have any officers back there with me? He said, no, young, young. I said, you kidding me? He said, no, I didn't believe it. I had seen my office, and I had seen the little cubicle area that I had as a chaplain. And you went down this hallway. And as you went down this hallway, you saw different offices for counselors. And across the hallway was a big kitchen or dining area for the prisoners. And as you go down the hallway, there's a big metal door in front of you. And you went through there, and there's a couple hundred inmates house there. Just through that one door. And then they had all these different dorms or buildings where the inmates were housed. And they were allowed at times to come over for counseling and spiritual counseling and see the regular counselors and things like that. And so they was constantly in and out. And as I went down this hallway and here's a counselor on this side and a counselor over here and a big door in front of me for all of a couple hundred inmates were housed, and over to the right is the dining area. Right there on the left was another metal door. And you go through that metal door and you start down another hallway. All that area was mine. As you go down that hallway, over on the right side was an office. At the end of the hallway was a big room where I could have about 25 people in there 
to teach them the Bible, do the counseling sessions, all that. And over on the left was a, a kind of a storage area where we give them things that they might need, like soap and toothpaste and toothbrushes and deodorant and just care stuff for those that were indigent, that nobody helped them and they had special needs. That was my area. In my area, I had two inmates that were lifers, that were to help me. Both were in for murder. Both had nothing to lose. Neither one was ever going to get out. So I got those two guys there to help me. And then I had all these guys coming and going. Now, mind you, when you first come in, counselor's over here, dining area over here, my hallway's over here, big metal door, and there's where 200 inmates are housed, and there's the little round room with glass all around it, and that's where the correctional officers are. And all these metal doors, you couldn't hear from one room to the next. And I said, Lord, I've seen where I'm supposed to work out of. And I get in there and I have a uh, agitated inmate that don't like what I say and don't like me. And he comes at me. What am I to do? Because there's no correction officers in that hallway where I'm at. In the main hallway where the other counselors are, you have to get back over where the inmates are. And I said, they can't hear me. And the word says, do the best you can to protect yourself. <laughs> and he said, by, and at this time, I was in my late 50s. He said, by no means tell them how old you are. Because they're going to take advantage of that. And says, they will come at you. And says, Pick up what you can, anything you need, the chair, whatever, defend yourself until somebody gets there. I said, they may never come because you can't hear me. It's a scary place in some way. I'm just glad that I had Jesus where I could go home every day. Uh, we faced giants in our lives. It didn't take me but a couple of days to get used to it and no longer bother me. And I found that the inmates love chaplains. They don't like correction officers. They don't like counselors. They don't like nobody except the chaplain because they felt like the chaplain would always be on their side and help them. And uh, when I learned that, I felt a lot more at ease. We had, over, we had close to 1,500 inmates and had 200 of them were Muslims. The Muslims didn't like Christians. The Muslims were always fighting with the chaplains before me. But they, for some reason, they like me. And they put the word out. And the Muslims are pretty bad dudes in there. They put the word out. Anybody bothers the chaplains, they'd have to face them. I thought, well, that's good. I got the Muslims on my side. And the reason I got the Muslims on my side is because everybody was treating them extra bad. And all they wanted was a copy of the Quran and a prayer rug so they could get out on their knees and pray. And they wouldn't. The former chaplains couldn't get it for them. And the former chaplains didn't really get many Bibles. I had Bibles coming in, Qurans coming in, prayer rugs coming in. I just went out in the Muslim community and said, these guys need some, need some counseling, they need some help. We can't, the, the prison system won't buy it. You want to donate it? I'll get it in to them. That way they can read the Quran. Most of them were very uh, docile very peace-minded me. And they just wanted to serve out their time and live in peace. As a matter of fact, the Muslims controlled themselves better than Christians did in there. It's a rough place in prison. It's not always a fun place. I don't know if you know this, but in the state prisons, they don't have to air condition them. I'm down in regional in the summertime. It's 100 degrees outside. We got a farm where they, and a dairy. You know what's around farms and dairies? Lots of big bugs, lots of gnats, lots of flies. 
a lot of heat. And he'd come into the prison, except in my office where I went in. But I was around the inmates in their dorms and places. It was a rough place. But I learned that God was with me and not to worry about it. And they used to have maybe 20 or 30 people come to the Bible study and worship service. And less than a year, we had over 200 come. They were able to lead over 200 men to the Lord in my time there. It made a change in your life. I worked monthly with Kairos and different ones. And <coughs> brought in all kinds of preachers. We went to having two or three revivals a month. And just God did a mighty work. And it was God that did it. Just had to get out of the way and let him do it. Amen. Facing giants. That's just one of my struggles that I faced in the past. I'm like you. I face things every day. Some out here in the world are facing drugs, some alcohol, some sex addiction. All kinds of stuff is out here. And they're giants. And they take control of our lives. Some people face the giants of stealing, lying. I've run into people in my life where the truth would have been so much simpler, would have been better on them, but they just always lie about it. What a giant's out there. Well, David has come up to, against a giant called Goliath. And I want to use him quickly as an example of how to face our giants today, whatever they may be. So let me give you three thoughts. The first thought about David facing his giants is he dared to be different. He dared to be different. He wasn't going with a status quo. He was not afraid of this giant. It says in verse 11 that all Israel was afraid of this giant, but not David. It tells us in verse 24 that when Goliath came out and challenged them, the Israelites, they fled. They ran away. David's own brothers told him he is crazy and tried to sway him to not get involved. Who are you? You're just a little kid. But David dared to be different. You ever dared to be different, especially when it comes to God? Your family don't go to church, but you do. Your family don't pray, but you do. Your friends don't read the Bible, but you do. You try to give when nobody else gives. You try to serve when nobody else does. You try to be positive when people are negative. Even in church, now get this, even in church people are negative. It's true, isn't it? Can I, can I get some amens? In church. We can't do this. We've never done it this way. We don't have the money. Well, we may not, but the Bible says God owns a cattle on a thousand hills, doesn't it? God owns it all. He's just trying to get some of it back from us that he's blessed us with. We can do anything that we want to do if God is in it. Anything, folks. We can grow as a church. We can accomplish great things if we follow God and God is in it. And that's what God has sent us to be the church. We're to represent him here on this earth. We're to show the love of Jesus. We are to be different. Not like the world. We're to be transformed and not conformed to the world. I've been here 10 months now. Thank you for putting up with me. I'm having a ball. Don't agree with everything. You don't agree with me on everything. That's fine. Randy and I laughed a little bit today. Talked a little bit. I said, Randy, I love you. He knows I love you. Randy's going like a great pastor. I told him I'd fight for him. I said, I won't always agree with you. But I'll support you and fight for you. Unless there's any doubt in your mind, I'm going to tell you right up front, and you should never doubt this. 
I won't always agree with every one of them. I'm kind of like that sometimes. But I'm going to tell you this truth. I will love every one of them. I will support every one of them. I will be there for every one of you the best I can. I don't want to go to But I won't always agree, and you will always agree with me. But never, because we disagree about anything, never doubt my love for you as my brother or my sister in the world. And that's what we're going to do to here. We're going to do together for God's glory. We're not doing anything for me. This is your church. I come to be your pastor. I want to make this church a bigger church, a better church, a greater church, a more spiritual church while I'm here. And when God takes me somewhere else, I want to walk away and say, I did everything I could. I laid it all on the line. I gave every bit of energy I've got, every bit of gifts and talents I had to make you a stronger Christian and a man a stronger church. I have my giants I face every day. And I dare to be different. I'm probably not like some ordinary, everyday Methodist pastor. Part of it is my background. Not growing up in church is part of it. Being a saved and licensed and baptized and ordained in an independent Baptist, which is very, very conservative, being from the mountains of North Carolina. Being a Southern Baptist pastor for 30-some years. Working in a prison working for hospice as a clinical chaplain, working in Spartanburg Hospital in the trauma unit as a clinical chaplain, and now a Methodist pastor. I got a, I am, I worked in a funeral home. I got all bases covered for another. I've got a variety of experience, and it makes me a different type of person. And I fight my battles every day, and I'll fight your battles alongside of you. And I dare to be different, and I dare you to be different. Yeah. Be committed to God. Yeah. And so few are. Number one. Number two, not only did David dare to be different, but David prepared himself. He prepared himself to face his giant. He did not come in empty-handed. Verse 40 tells us, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in his grip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. Five smooth stones. But God was with him. David, why did he need five? Why did he just need one? Some of you shake your head if you know the answer to that. I don't see many, I see a couple. Goliath had four brothers. David was going to take on the whole family. He wasn't afraid. He figured, better be prepared. He killed Goliath. Here comes the other four. Why he killed him? Two problems. And of course, we know he didn't have to. But he was prepared himself. We have to be prepared to face our giants. What do we do to be prepared to face the giants? We do it here today. Worship helps you prepare. Christian fellowship helps you to prepare. Prayer helps you prepare. Bible study helps you to prepare. Doing the things of God, like service, helps you to prepare. Giving. God says, you can't out and give me. Giving helps you prepare. God's going to make sure you have everything you need. David dared to be different. And David prepared himself. He got his five smooth stones. And then he went up to face his giant. Are you getting what you need? so that you can prepare. We anointed Sonny today for his help. He's being prepared. He wanted prayer. What do you need today? What are you asking God to give you to prepare for whatever's going on in your life? 
He will. He loves to bless. What does it say in the Bible at one point that we know how to, we think we know how to give good gifts, but sometimes our gifts aren't really that good. But the gifts that God gives, they are perfect. They're the right gift. If you need energy, pray for energy. If you need help, pray for help. If you need guidance, pray for guidance. Whatever your needs are, for you, for your family, for your church, God will provide. He will. Last point. Not only did David dare to be different and to face the giant, he dared to prepare himself. He did prepare himself. But most important of all, he kept his eyes on God. Many of us are like Peter when he got out of the boat and started walking on water. He was watching Jesus and he was walking on water. And all of a sudden the storm was so big and so raging, he turned and looked the storm. And he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. He cried, hey, help me, Jesus, help me. And he turned his eyes back to Jesus and Jesus lifted him up and put him safely in the boat. Listen, folks. When we take our eyes off of God, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, we will sink. We will sink. Can you see God in the last 10 months, what we've been through? We ask God to bless us, to get us out of debt. We're out of debt. We ask God to provide a mower. He provided a mower. We ask God to provide us for a piano. He's provided us for a piano. We're asking Him for a few more things in the upcoming months. We've gone from $8,000 in savings in a money market to $31,000 while we're doing all of that. Can you not see God at work? Can you not see his blessings upon us? Don't take your eyes off of what God wants and see. It'd be easy to get comfortable and say, okay, we've accomplished this, let's rest on our laurels. But folks, when we are dead and gone, if the Lord tarries his coming, there will still be people living around here. And I would like to think that this church will be a light in this community after I'm dead and gone. And I hope those of you that have put 20, 30, and 40 years into this church want to see it here and thriving after you're dead and gone because you put hours and days and money and energy and your gifts into this church. Let it remain as a symbol of God at work. I don't know what all God wants us to accomplish. I'm trying to take it little by little. We're praying that first Sunday in June, we're going to start a Hispanic service at 2.30 in the afternoon. We're praying. And it's going to probably come about. And I look for it to come about. And I expect it to come about. And we're going to start an evening service for those who want to come in the evening for a regular worship service. We're looking to reach out to anybody and everybody. Randy and I talked today about maybe starting our own type. We're doing it somewhat, and we're encouraging and supporting uh, Wright Culpepper because he reaches out to this whole area in doing things. And we're hoping to start a maybe his hands ministry or something along that line here. And Randy's excited about it. We need to get behind Randy and support him in that so that not only, we can't reach all over this town, but we want to make an impact in our community. And we want to come and help those that are widows and those that are shut-ins and those that are hurting. And we may need to just come and climb a little ladder and put a light bulb in. Because they can't see their bathroom because the light bulb went out and they don't have family or nobody to come and change a light bulb. We just won't put Chip up a ladder. Because he falls off that. We'll keep him on the ground and we'll find something to chip to do. Yeah. We have to have a little fun. But there's all kinds of things to do. 
to reach out. And folks, quite honest, it's kind of like having a tiger by the tail. I don't like grabbing a tiger by the tail because it's a wild thing to hold on to. But we got a tiger by the tail. God is willing to use us in such a mighty way. And if we don't do it, I'll say, okay, you don't want to serve, you don't want to do it. I'll just take my blessings down the road to the next church that does want to. And so we're going to do some things. We're trying to see the face of God. Listen, folks, I got giants, you got giants, we face it. Whatever they may be. Let's do like David. He dared to be different. He dared to take on his giant and not run away from it or sit around wringing his hands saying, oh me, oh my. He prepared himself. And he kept his eyes on God. The Israelites looked at Goliath and they said, look how much bigger is he than us. And David said, yeah, look at Goliath. Look how much smaller he is than God. The Israelite says, he's too big to hit. David says, he's too big to miss. <laughs> Folks, let's face our giants. And let's stay close to God. And he will bless us individually. He will bless our families. He will bless our church. He will bless the work we put our hands to as we seek his face. May God bless you through the understanding of his word. Chris is going to come, leave us in our invitation song, Janice is going to come and play. During this time, it's your time to come. If you want to come and kneel at the altar, altar we invite you to come. We want to pray for yourself, we want to pray for your church, we want to pray for others, you come. This is your time. If you need me to pray with you, I'll be over to the side and be glad to pray with you. If you can't kneel, you can stand. This is your time, folks. You guys on God. Bring your cares and cast them on Him because He cares for you. And then afterwards, we'll have for you. Would you stand? Let's go to us in our invitation. Let's all join in as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty.
We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not been your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us with joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin, slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, died Christ, Christ is risen, risen Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for you, for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for you, for you the world and the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world. <clears throat> Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all power and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as we prepare ourselves to... Take of the Lord's Supper, communion. All are involved and guided to join at the Lord's table. Randy, would you come and help? We have two young people coming forward to be our acolytes today. <laughs> Bring the light of the world into our church. That's what the candles represent. And as they extinguish it here and carry it out, it represents us going out into the world to show the light of Jesus. So that's why we do this each Sunday. And so this is going to represent us as God's people going out and letting our lives shine.
Father, we thank you for the new covenant that you've brought in your body. It extends the grace that we need to be presented before you as pure and flawless. Now use us in a mighty way as we leave this place. Equip us and enable us to go out and share your gospel message.